Thursday, 15 January, 1953. This is Operation Information. You're about to hear the inside story on radio in American sector, Berlin. You will hear some good news from the post exchanges. And you're about to hear an on-the-spot report of the changing of the guard between America and the Soviet Union. Yes, you will hear these and other stories on your weekly radio newsreel, Operation Information. information microphone has moved to Berlin to bring you the complete story on the strengthening of Allied border patrols on the outer boundary of this city. In charge of the American forces patrolling the West Berlin Soviet zone border is Lieutenant Colonel H.G. Getz, U.S. Provost Marshal here. Colonel Getz, for what reason have the Western Allies bolstered their patrol forces near the Soviet zone? Recent incidents have resulted in the West Berlin German authorities asking for increased security measures of some kind. The Western Allied Commandants have ruled that only the military forces under their command have the authority and responsibility to operate such patrols. Exactly what measures have been taken to comply with the request made by German authorities? The frequency which military police patrols visit points along the border within their assigned area has been considerably increased. Also, there has been an increase in the number of points along the border which are visited by the military police patrols. What effect is this having on the individual military policemen here? It has required him to give more attention to details along the border and to maintain a close liaison with West German police agency. Do you believe that this increased vigilance will contribute materially to the preservation of law and order in the U.S. sector of Berlin? Yes, I do. We all know how quickly we slow down our vehicles when we see a police car. I believe that the presence of our military police patrols will have the same effect upon any person about to commit an act of lawlessness, regardless of his background. Our operation information microphone has been situated in Berlin, where Lieutenant Colonel Goetz, Berlin Command Provost Marshal, has outlined U.S. policy in the newly established border security policy. As the year 1952 came to a close and the European exchange system closed its books, the system announced a $4,100,000 customer dividend. In our AFN Nuremberg studios is the European exchange officer, Colonel William H. Kendall, to break down this figure, ask, and we're going to ask him how they happen to arrive at such a large figure. Colonel? Well, this figure of $4,100,000 was the amount that we figured that we were going to earn over and above the necessary welfare dividend requirements had the merchandise remained at the old price. We selected those items of merchandise which we thought would do the most to stimulate morale and good feeling in our customers and cut the prices on those certain items of merchandise. This figure of four million a hundred thousand is a difference between the old price and the present lowered price. Well then actually uh, it is a price reduction which over uh, I presume a 12 month uh, period will give back to the customers of EES the $4 million figure. Is that correct? That's exactly it. And that's uh, what you call a customer dividend. That's right. We uh, we call it a customer dividend uh, over the counter. Mm-hmm. In other words, the customer gets his dividend as he buys the merchandise. Well, Colonel, being the number one man in the European exchange system and having been here just a little over a year... What would you say was the biggest advancement in your organization in the year 1952? Well, I think probably the biggest was the uh, new procedure in the uh, stock control uh, and inventory procedure as far as our retail merchandise is concerned. It used to take uh, over 30 days to move merchandise from a warehouse into a store. Our present goal is three days. Uh, That ensures that the customer gets uh, fresh, new, 
uh, not shop-worn uh, merchandise, and it is a great boon to keeping our shelves full of merchandise and not subjecting the customer to the irritating uh, occurrences and reoccurrences of being out of merchandise on the day the customer wants a particular item. Well, I'm sure our listeners, who actually are the customers of EES, will agree that this is a, a good step. From 30 days to 3 days is a lot of advance. Colonel Kendall, in dealing with EES, uh, speaking to your executives and to your vendors, you often hear the term pipeline used. Just what is uh, meant by pipeline? Well, a pipeline is really our serious problem. The pipeline through which our merchandise must flow from the states is a matter of from three or four months. And when you're talking about three or four months, of merchandise in the pipeline, you're talking about just that many dollars. We are attempting in every way possible to shorten that pipeline and shorten the number of dollars that remain idle while the merchandise is in the pipeline. One expedient which we're exploiting at great length is uh, procuring as many items we can on the continent. The other expedient is to have as many vendors as possible warehouse for us somewhere on the European continent. And so if we want a particular item uh, on our shelves next June, we've got to start planning and actually ordering it as early as February. Speaking of planning, what are your plans for the year 1953? Uh, one of our biggest problems... Uh, is, again, shortening this pipeline. We intend to exploit to the fullest sources which are closer to us. That means more continental procurement. Whenever the continental price is right and the delivery terms are right, we would, of course, prefer to procure nearer our stores. We have buyers uh, who are traveling in all of the European countries. Uh, we also have buyers now, our own buyers in New York, because, of course, there are still typically American items which are only obtainable in America. So the, the secret of our success in getting the merchandise to the customer quicker is to have buyers who really know their business buying merchandise wherever it's available at the lowest possible price. Well, and uh, once again on prices and perhaps in conclusions and speaking from the vantage point of January, are there price reductions in sight? Uh, I always uh, dislike being too optimistic in advance, but I feel that it is quite possible that with our continual campaign to shorten the amount of our dollars and therefore our expense, because we have to insure all the merchandise that's in our pipeline, we will be able to pass some more customer dividends back to the customers next year. Operation Information Microphone is situated in Berlin, where we are getting a glimpse of RIAS, the American-sponsored German-language broadcasting station here. That was the RIAS identification tone, the sound that tells all RIAS listeners, both in East and West Germany, that they are tuned to the channel that assures them of accurate information and good programming 24 hours a day. In order to find out more about this fine production at RIAS, we have with us Mr. Tom Brown, Musical and Production Director of RIAS. Mr. Brown, could you tell us how large is this station? Well, RIAS is a pretty large station. We have two uh, medium-wave transmitters, one of them 100,000 watts, the other one 40,000. We have a 20,000-watt shortwave transmitter, which is frequently heard in Australia, and we have a 3,000-watt uh, FM transmitter. The station itself has about 600 German employees on payroll, another another 250 on personal contract and has constant dealings with freelance artists here in Berlin. The American staff consists of seven. What is the exact purpose of RIAS in this city behind the Iron Curtain? Well, its purpose derives from the very fact that it is behind the Iron Curtain. 
the uh, United States government maintains this station as a means of keeping in touch with the people in the Soviet zone who have been cut off from all contact with the free world. And Rios's main purpose here is to inform them of the truth that is going on and from which they are kept. From the response that you have received from your broadcast, do you believe that this purpose is being accomplished? Well, we know very well that our message is getting through. Uh, one of the best ways we know it is the fact that the communists in this east zone, Soviet zone, are our deadly enemies. The present press campaign against Rias in the Soviet communist-controlled press over there has reached uh, tidal wave proportions. And just recently, they've taken to actually jamming us on both of our medium wavelengths. When we first came to Rias for this interview, which, by the way, is being made on their equipment to simplify matters, I was under the impression that this station would be no different than the others I had seen elsewhere. Now, one of the things I'm interested in is a bit on the technical side, namely what you call drug funk or wired wireless. Yes, that is something that I don't think most Americans are familiar with. Uh, it goes back into the beginning history of RIAS when it was called DIAS, Drahtfunk, in the American sector. Uh, when we first started operation, we didn't even have a transmitter. What we did have, though, was equipment that was uh, able to put a signal onto the telephone wire, which could be taken off in private homes by a connection between the telephone apparatus and the radio. That is what... Uh, is known as Trotfunk or wired wireless. That sounds somewhat like the system for wired television in the United States, although I understand that this method doesn't interfere with telephone calls. Right here, we might also mention that Rios broadcasts on both AM and FM. By the way, how long each day does Rios stay on the air? We're on the air around the clock. We have actually a uh, one-and-a-half-hour pause in the mid-morning because we need that time for necessary technical repairs. But in general, we can be heard almost any time of the day. Speaking of these technical repairs, we might remind our listeners that the engineers here have quite a responsibility with all the engineering equipment in this building. Just how many studios does Rios have at its disposal? We have uh, eight studios in operation in the building, but because of the large musical groups that we have, we also maintain two studios outside headquarters, one a church and one a, an outside studio for the accommodation of our larger groups. In addition to that, we also have a number of mobile units, trucks we equipped for uh, broadcast and reception, and these travel throughout the city picking up special features and local stories and so on. I noticed while touring the building that some of the studios here are not tiny affairs either. One of them, I believe, it was the Studio 7, the size of an auditorium with wonderful acoustics. Do the German people have a liking for popular American music? They certainly have. One of our most popular programs is something that comes every Monday evening at 8 and is called Hit Parade. Uh, I invite you to take a listen to that show. It's one of the best ones you'll hear. Uh, that is probably our most popular show. It's a jazz dance music program, and it has a really enthusiastic following among the younger set. I hate to break in right here, but if I'm not wrong, a Rio station break is scheduled in a few seconds. Could we catch that on a recording to let our listeners know just what an identification is like on Rios? Okay, here it is. Fünfzehn Uhr hier ist Rios Berlin. Guten Tag, verehrte Hörer. Wir bringen Ihnen jetzt unseren Schulfunk. Now you'll notice that that was a, a pretty brief affair for a station break. That has a purpose. Rios uh, listening is a dangerous activity to people in the Soviet zone. It's not advisable to make too big a thing yourself of the fact that you are Rios, and we try to use the word Rios as little as possible. Could you give us a brief idea just before we leave here what Rios programming is like throughout the day? Well, I said earlier that our main purpose here was to keep the people in the Soviet zone informed of what's going on in the world about them. We try to uh, include this informative material in an all-around program of a general entertaining nature. And we try to offer as much of general interest to the public as we can. Of course, we have a great deal of music, light music, dance music, <coughs> also a good deal of serious music. We have many sport features. We have special programs for women, for children, for businessmen, for farmers, and so on. And the result of this production, fine listening for the German people in and around Berlin.
Twice a month, a group of students, ex-students, and interested persons meet in Nuremberg to discuss problems that affect us all. These people call themselves the International Discussion Group. With Bob Naus now at our AFN Nuremberg microphone are two of the group. Private Martin Brower, holder of a master's degree in labor relations from the University of Pennsylvania, and Reinhard Obike, a German national who did graduate study as an exchange student at the University of Arizona. Now to Nuremberg and Bob Naus. Call on Reinhardt to tell us what is the International Discussion Group. Well, Bob, the uh, International Discussion Club is one of the several activities of the Nuremberg chapter of the International Student Association, ISSF, a German Student Association with headquarters and, at Bonn, and which is affiliated with several international student movements throughout the Western world. As I understand it, you have quite a group of people meet down there twice monthly. Yes, about a, a group of about 40 people meet twice a month at the uh, Weinstadel here at Nuremberg. And uh, who are representative in that group? Well, uh, the group is mainly composed of Americans and Germans, but they are also uh, they have also members of 11 other countries participated in these meetings. Mm -hmm. And you do have a number of soldiers down there. As a soldier, uh, Martin, how do you feel that you're gaining by taking part in this discussion group? Well, I have the uh, excellent opportunity here in this discussion group of uh, meeting uh, uh, Germans on a, a social and uh, cultural uh, relationship where uh, usually I wouldn't find some of the other activities that an average soldier particip participates in. Well, you feel then that you're gaining because you're learning to know these people better. Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, I've uh, come to know them in the several months that I've participated in this group. Uh, we have uh, social functions which enlarge my friendship and my understanding uh, of the, the uh, German people. And uh, what topics are discussed? Well, uh, we've discussed uh, a number of topics. Uh, uh, more recently, we've discussed the average citizen and his if relation to his government, uh, American-German relations, uh, discrimination, and its destroying inf influences on world uh, federation. Mm -hmm. Then you do definitely feel that as a soldier of the United States Army, you are profiting by meeting and talking with these people. Yes, this is an excellent opportunity that ordinarily I wouldn't uh, have found. Mm -hmm. Now let's put the shoe on the other foot and ask you as a German national, Reinhardt, how you feel that uh, you are profiting. Well, Bob, here is the opportunity particularly for Americans and Germans to meet. And we hope that from our small group, the circle of understanding will grow and grow. I see. Well, back to you, Martin. Do you feel that you're solving anything in this group? Well, it's pretty hard to solve uh, such heavy uh, problems as we cover. But if not solving the problems, at least my understanding of them is uh, uh, being enlarged. It's growing through the opportunity to meet uh, people that ordinarily I wouldn't have met. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I also think that we uh, learn to tolerate and respect the opinion of people from other countries. The capital city of Vienna, Austria, is divided into four sectors, similar to that of Berlin. However, in Vienna, there is one district that is operated by all four powers, each taking control for a month at a time. On December 31st, the Soviet Union turned over the command of this district to the United States. For an unusual on-the-spot report of this ceremony, we take you to Vienna and VDN's Bud Miller. One of the biggest drawing cards for tourists, military personnel of the United States Army, American civilians attached to the Army, and Austrian civilians, is the formal change of the International Guard in the city of Vienna. In the next few moments, we shall bring you a verbal picture of this ceremony in order that you too may join us as we witness the action about to take place below us. Our vantage point is a balcony about 50 feet above the street in the famed Palace of Justice in Vienna, Austria. Now here's the general procedure for the ceremony itself. At the time of this broadcast, the Soviet element will turn over the chairmanship of the Allied Council to the American element, and as the ceremony opens, the Soviet element band will lead two guard platoons onto the parade ground before us, followed by the American 49th Army Band and two American guard platoons. These military units will then form for inspection in the center and in front of the Palace of Justice. Now, it is here that one of the most colorful phases of the ceremony can be seen. With all officers and troops at attention, the Soviet band plays the Soviet national anthem, and their flag atop the Palace of Justice is lowered. Then, as the Stars and Stripes are sent aloft, the 49th Army Band plays the national anthem of the United States of America. 
Now, this signifies the release and acceptance of Vienna Inter-Allied Command. Following the playing of the national anthems, the officers representing the two nations shake hands, salute, and prepare to review the troops. Representing the United States of America today will be Brigadier General William T. Fitz, Jr. of Asheville, North Carolina, now City Commander, U.S. Element, Vienna Inter-Allied Command. Representing the Soviet Union will be Major General Boreko, City Commander, Soviet Element, Vienna Inter-Allied Command. Colonel Sadich will also be to his right, Deputy Commander of the Vienna Inter-Allied Command, and Lieutenant Colonel Granaderov, Soviet uh, Element Officer of the Vienna First District. that action is beginning down below us on the main street before the Palace of Justice. The music you hear in the background is that of the Soviet band as they move from our right to march forward and come down in front of the Palace of Justice. A huge band comprised of about uh, 80 pieces. In today's ceremony, the Soviet soldiers are dressed in their dark olive uniforms, which are trimmed in red. Black riding boots are highly polished, and the headdress is the regulation Soviet service cap with the big red star in the center. Now, the weapon they carry is held at right shoulder arms, and only the soldiers in the front rank carry automatic weapons, and those, of course, are carried at port arms. The Soviet band itself is led by a standard bearer, and the standard he carries is beautifully golden in color, bedecked with red streamers, or we might call them red ribbons. And as the band goes by, we see the Vienna Allied Guard of the Soviet element that moves up forward. They break rank. The band moves forward into the parking lot in front of the Palace of Justice. The guard commander and one platoon leader moves forward, and they'll form directly in front of the Palace of Justice, as we told you in the beginning of our program, for inspection. A very impressive sight to see indeed as the Soviet band has moved in front of the Palace of Justice, and as the Soviet Guard platoon with a very peculiar step. This is one particular part of the ceremony that we wanted to tell you about, is the, the marching step of the Soviet soldier and the Soviet Guard platoons. It is one that is very familiar, as a matter of fact. During the Nazi era, between 1938 and 1945, Many of the civilian population around Europe was very familiar with the goose step of the German army. And this particular marching step is somewhat used by the Soviet army. And now the band is standing fast in the parking lot in front of our Palace of Justice in Vienna, Austria. The Soviet guard platoon has moved to the left where they'll take up their position. And the guard commander for the Soviet element will carry on his inspection. In the distance, we hear another band strike up. This will be the 49th Army Band, which will lead the American element, inter-allied guard, onto the break ground and before us. We might add here that the 49th Army Band is under the direction of Warrant Officer Peter A. Parkinson of Vancouver, Washington. The American Element Guard, immaculate in appearance, is dressed in olive drab uniforms with green raincoats. We note, too, that each U.S. soldier wears white gloves, white service cap, and, of course, white leggings. Their boots also glisten, as does the weapon they carry at right shoulder arm. And at 
the band moves directly before our microphones here at the Palace of Justice, they will also step into the vacated area before this building and take up their place. And directly behind them, of course, are the two American Guard platoons. The guard dresses right, and the inspection begins by the American Guard commander, platoon leaders, and of course, at the same moment, the Soviet element is inspecting its guard far to our left on this play at parade ground. And we notice that the news photographers are moving rapidly down below us in order to get photographs. We might add that they follow this general routine each and every month as each of the four powers take over from the other to assume the duties in the Vienna Inter-Allied Command. There are about 2,000 people down below us on the street which forms and is used as our parade ground for this particular ceremony. We might add that this is one of the few times in the year and one of the few times at all that any spectators have a chance to do any photography which will give them the chance to take back home pictures of the Soviet soldiers and American soldiers together. We understand that they are allowed to take just as many pictures as they want to, just as long as they do not interfere with the procession or the ceremony itself. We might add, too, that the broadcast of this international change in the city of Vienna is the first of its kind. As far as we can recall, there has never been a broadcast where a complete description has been given of this ceremony that is held each and every month before the Palace of Justice in Vienna, Austria. I do not believe that they have any change of this type in the four-power city of Berlin, Germany. It is merely that they are separated into four zones and each power remains within its zone. But here in Vienna, due to the location of the Vienna First District, this particular ceremony had to be brought about for the change of the International Guard, which, as we said earlier in the program, controls the guarding of the Vienna First District. Major Capshaw has now moved off. And he is going front and center to meet the Soviet Guard Commander. Soviet Guard Commander with the, a very familiar goose step steps forward. They stop. Salute. The Soviet Commander says, I am ready to turn over the Vienna Inter-Allied Guard duty. Major Capshaw repeats, I am ready to accept the Vienna Inter-Allied Guard duty. They salute and return immediately to their unit. You have just heard what report of the changing of the Vienna Inter-Allied Guard between the American element and the Soviet element, which took place in Vienna on the 31st of December. This has been Operation Information, a 30-minute radio newsreel of Europe This Week. This program was written and produced in our Frankfurt studios by Sergeants Mel Riddle and Bob Harlan. Your narrator was Airman Al Walter. Now this is Sergeant Chuck Renner inviting you to be with us next Thursday at 20 hours for next week's highlights and sidelights of news in Europe, events now in the making on Operation Information. Information.